Hello everyone, how's it going? In this video, we're going to talk about Palantir, trading under the ticker symbol PLTR. As the market remains very volatile at the moment, we should always be mindful of which positions to pick, as well as their individual timing and exposure. Before the video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Over the past few days, Palantir was mostly predicted to eventually take a path downward, as the AI momentum that pushed Palantir stock upward now seems to have paused, or at least needs a pullback before it can gather enough steam once again to resume the upward push. To be honest, the current price action does seem a little bit overbought, even if there are good reasons for it. On one hand, Palantir released very robust financial results, suggesting that a company can now stand on its own feet in terms of cash flow needs. The company has been able to generate gross profit for a long time, and recently it's also been able to generate a net profit after all the fixed costs. This means that Palantir's business model has been validated by the market itself, and that any sort of substantial growth of scale in the future would be justified. On the other hand, there is, I suspect, a strong case of what we can call as a desire for the market, and especially the retail side of the market, to make Palantir a self-fulfilling prophecy, that enough speed will regenerate, will self-generate itself into a bigger momentum. This is a little bit of a wishful thinking, of course, but judging by the robust volume that Palantir continues to have, despite an obvious price action suggesting for pullback, it definitely says something about the retail investors' willingness to put in their hope in Palantir. With that being said, let's also take a look at the technicals. The trading volume for Palantir has recently been around 51 million shares versus an average volume of 57 million shares. Over the previous 52 weeks period, the price fluctuated between $5.84 and $20.24. The market cap of Palantir is currently around $33 billion compared to an enterprise value of $29 billion. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 11% higher than the one-month low, 12% higher than the three-month low, and 161% higher than the 52-week low. On the options market, which often gives a hint on the market sentiment about where the stock price is probably going to go next, the implied volatility here is around 54% compared to a historical volatility of 78%. The put-call volume ratio is currently 0.71. It's normal for most stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they truly deserve, as many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded is 185,000 contracts a day, versus the 30-day average volume of 402,000. In terms of open interest, the most recent volume of open interest is around 2.5 million contracts, compared to the 30-day average of 2.8 million contracts. The option contracts are tools allowing traders to hedge their risk, increase their exposure with limited exposure or downside, or to even create a revenue stream. They are derivative options contracts based on the underlying security to give the traders the opportunity to buy or sell the security at a strike price and helps them to limit the potential downside. The put options allow selling at a strike price, usually chosen for the anticipated downturn, and the call options allow for buying at a strike price usually chosen for the anticipated bullish run. Regarding the shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 35% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, BlackRock, and Renaissance. 
Usually, it is better to see some institutional participation when holding a stock long term, because it offers a layer of stability and a token of reliability for the long term investment option. It means that the market is confident that this company will eventually deliver. I personally believe that the minimum threshold to be around 25 to 30 percent of institutional ownership. Of course, there are some exceptions. But there will always be great companies, mostly owned by retail as well. The current short interest is seven percent of the total float, and forty-three percent of the transactions come from the dark pools. Typically, if the short interest is around fifteen percent or more, then we have a case for short squeeze. It's not the case right now, even though, admittedly, it's still very significant. This can be correlated with the high amount of put options, expecting the stock price to drop. So overall, I think that the market behavior is still mostly balanced and normal, with a logic behind, and we don't really have to worry about any sort of institutional like manipulation. So right now, the global markets are facing a complex interplay of factors that have the potential to significantly influence the equities. Worldwide, in this speculative analysis, I believe that the consequences of the global inflation, surging commodity prices, and decline quantitative easing, as well as the rise of inflation rates or interest rates, plus the geopolitical instabilities, are going to play a significant part. The increasing inflation rate has been putting pressures across the globe, threatening the purchasing power. Raising the input costs and impacting corporate profitability, companies operating internationally may face challenges in managing rising production costs and also to sustain profit margins. Those dynamics could trigger market volatility as investors adjust their risk-return expectations. The upward trajectory of commodity prices, including energy, metals, agricultural products. Have been having far-reaching implications for various sectors of the global equities market. The companies heavily dependent on these commodities may experience squeezed profit margins, potentially affecting stock valuations and investor sentiment. The reduction or the end of QE's quantitative easing measures by the central banks worldwide may have resulted in reduced market liquidity. So this, in turn, could lead to higher borrowing costs for companies seeking capital, which may also discourage investment activities or will. The elevated market volatility, plus the reduced investors' appetite, may also continue to occur. Now, the central banks around the world are tackling this delicate situation of balancing the inflation rates. With the economic stability and, if possible, growth, central banks opted for aggressive interest rate hikes to combat inflation. Borrowing costs for companies have been rising, which has also slowed down business activities and also fueling the market's volatility in terms of the equity prices. Now, ongoing geopolitical tensions, including trade disputes. Political uncertainties and social unrest will inject an additional element of volatility into the global markets. Investors may adopt a cautious approach, shifting towards safer assets, impacting the equities. Additionally, the escalating conflicts may disrupt supply chains, negatively impacting the performance of international companies. Given the interconnectedness. Of global markets, the aforementioned factors have reverberating effects on the U.S. equities market. Companies with significant exposure to international market may face a lot of headwinds resulting from the economic slowdowns, disrupting the supply chains, and the currency fluctuations. But nevertheless, the U.S. market is known for its resilience and the diverse sectors. 
may attract investors seeking safe havens. So really, the current landscape is characterized by global inflation, surging commodity prices, surging commodity prices, reduced quantitative easing, rising central bank inflation rates, geopolitical instabilities, and also ongoing lack of certainty regarding growth. While the U.S. market may exhibit relative strength due to the safe haven status, it's going to remain interconnected with the global economic landscape. For long-term investors, these conditions may offer opportunities to identify undervalued companies with strong fundamentals and international diversification. With that being said, short-term trades should be approached with caution because of the increased volatility and uncertainty. And also, we should be careful when assessing individual companies, sectors, or regions, instead of choosing ETFs. With that being said, my recommendation is to either slow down the current purchases or to stand on the sidelines with the existing exposure in Palantir and to wait for the market to decide whether it wants to continue on the current trajectory upward or it, if it wants to go back to lower levels such as $10 to let the profit taking to occur. I would recommend to commit between 3 to 5% of your portfolio's capital overall on Palantir at all time and would also recommend to split the allocation in 20% batches at a time.